I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this episode of What the Ship, this week in maritime news. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, before we get started with our five stories, let's do a couple of updates real quick. Our first update deals with the HMS Prince of Wales. This was the aircraft carrier that was sailing from Portsmouth, England, to take part in an operation across in America. The ship failed to sail because of an issue with its starboard shaft. This story by USNI Press, uh, Sam Legrone, talks about it and includes a clip from the Royal Navy, Admiral Morehouse, where he describes what happened. Basically, the ship had two propeller shafts, two screws. The starboard shaft has a series of couplings. It's not one long metal shaft, but a series of shafts attached together with these couplings. Well, one of these couplings have failed and basically the shaft separated. And this has resulted in damage to the screw, to the propeller, and to the rudder. Uh, not to the ship itself, but what they're going to have to do is dry dock the vessel, pull this all out, repair it, and affix uh, a new shaft and propeller. This means that the vessel will not be able to sail. And in her stead, the HMS Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth has departed to take that mission. So an update to a previous story. Other story, the OS-35, which was the bulker that went aground off of, excuse me, that got collided with off of Gibraltar, then went aground. We had reported on her leaking fuel oil. Most of the oil has been removed from her at this time. Booms are in place around the vessels. And uh, Smith, a uh, salvage company from the Netherlands, is in place to oversee the salvage of the vessel. As we mentioned in an earlier report, the ship broke up on the forward part of the vessel between the one, two, and three hold. And so this salvage will be a very difficult one. We may actually see the vessel fully separate uh, from it to be able to get her free or else they'll have to try to pump her out and raise her. But being in the very damaged condition she's in, they gotta be extremely careful not to have the entire ship roll founder uh, a difficult situation she's in but fortunately they've gotten that oil off last the solomon islands this is the group of islands that basically uh, did not respond fast enough for a u.s coast guard cutter and therefore was denied entry into the port to refuel uh, the solomon islands are right now hosting usns mercy the hospital ship uh, they just announced that while they're still maintaining their prohibition on vessels, naval vessels coming in, they did note that basically they're going to exempt the Australian and New Zealand Navy from that ban. So some naval vessels will be able to get in, but not all. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our first story. Story number one deals with the importation of liquefied natural gas into Europe. So Russia has basically cut off most, if not all, of the liquefied natural gas that's going to be heading to Europe. And by the end of the year, probably see it all cut off. There was a disruption in the Nord Stream 1 pipeline this past week. They've, you know, Nord Stream 2 isn't going to go operational at all. And Europe is looking at issues about liquefied natural gas coming into their country to basically fuel their power plants. Now, most of the LNG that came into Europe came by pipelines and went directly into plants and areas to be used. But now it's being imported by ship. But you just can't take liquefied natural gas off a ship and, and pump it ashore. It doesn't work that way. Liquefied natural gas is cooled, super cooled, down to 260 degrees, uh, negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what turns it from a vapor to a liquid. And so these ships, these LNG carriers that carry this fuel, they can't just pump it ashore because if it's not being cooled, it'll expand. And so what they need is special facilities to do this ashore. Problem is Europe doesn't have all those facilities set up ashore. So what they're doing in the case of Great Britain, excuse me, in the case of Germany and now the Netherlands is they're bringing in these floating terminals. This story right here by John Conrad. First LNG tanker at New Dutch floating terminal. They're bringing in what are called FSRUs, floating storage regasification units. They basically can handle up to 8 billion cubic meters of gas a year. And what they do is they take the LNG from a tanker, store it in there, 
and then they basically turn it back into the gas without it getting out of control. You've got to warm it back up. Uh, you've got to control the volume as it expands. And so you need this type of facility to do this. And the Netherlands has set it up. They're going to have two of these operating there. Uh, they're talking about them right there, the Exmar S-188 and the Golar Igloo. So these two vessels, they're not the prettiest ships in the world, but again, they're not really designed for looks. They're designed to be these uh, processes. Germany has the same thing. They were able to get their hands on several of these, hook them up, and now they're able to use them for their regasification. This is a major issue that has to be done so that when the temperatures begin to drop in Europe, you can bring in this liquefied natural gas. Now, this sounds great. We've got Netherlands, we've got Germany doing this. And then you see this story that comes in behind the scenes. Traders hoard LNG at sea before EU's long winter. Ships are being loaded right now with liquefied natural gas. United States is one of the biggest exporters of liquefied natural gas. Qatar or Qatar and Australia are the other ones. They're loading up ships right now, but it doesn't mean the ships are all heading to Europe or to their final destination. This story by Bloomberg talks about the fact that some of these vessels are just basically loitering. At least nine vessels storing LNG in the ocean, according to Bluebird and Kepler shipping data. The tanker British partner was idling in the South China Sea. Uh, it goes on here. The Aristides One is waiting in the Caribbean with Dominican Republic origin and US gas on board, said Matthew Ang, at, an analyst at Kepler. And if you pull it up, that's exactly what they're showing. This is the Aristis One, uh, Malta flag, LNG. It's showing drift in the Caribbean, fully loaded. And you're sitting there going, wait a minute, why would they drift around with LNG on board? This fuel is loaded by a broker. And this broker is hoping to see higher costs in other ports. If all of a sudden fuel begins to spike and it's worth more, they'll divert these tankers to where they can sell the LNG for the most amount of money. This happens with diesel fuel, it happens with crude oil, happens in the tanker industry all the time. It's one of the reasons why we sh saw shortages of gas and diesel in the Northeast part of the United States because speculators were taking gas and oil out of the Northeast United States or destined for the Northeast part of the US and shipping them over to Europe and other places where they could sell them for a better profit. Yet then they scream that there are shortages everywhere, but brokers are making their money on this deal. It's the CD side, the behind the side, behind the scenes side of the tanker industry that most people don't ever see or realize. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. The story number two is going to take us over to Ukraine. The Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, UN grain deal has been very interesting to watch unfold. Uh, this story from Reuters, the Ukraine grain deal faces mountains of trouble. Understand that the Ukraine grain deal is seeing grain come out of, of the region. We see this story right here, wheat prices drop after Ukraine green, grain deal, uh, uh, ship deal. We see uh, uh, this story right here about the largest uh, convoy coming out of the region. This was 13 vessels that came out, a total of 282,500 tons. So it was an impressive amount of vessels. But right now what we're hearing is that Russia is threatening to pull the plug on this deal because they feel like the reciprocity of the deal is not playing forward. So you're seeing vessels coming out of Ukraine. And again, they're coming out in these groups, not convoys. The, the UN doesn't want to talk about convoys because convoys mean Navy escorts. These ships have no Navy escorts. But what the UN is seeing is this grains coming out. And the real beneficiary of this is, let me be clear, not really Ukraine. Number one, it's Russia. Russia is the beneficiary of this deal because in return, Russia gets to freely export food, fuel, and fertilizer. However, Russia is feeling like that open uh, uh, season on their food, fuel, and fertilizer is not being accepted. Instead, there are still barriers for them getting out. And that's why they're really opposing this. The other country that gets a great deal out of this is Turkey. Turkey makes most of the world's flour. About 40% of the world's flour is made in Turkey. 
And so all this wheat that's going out of Ukraine and Russia goes to Turkey largely. And they're milling that into flour to sell in the market. If they don't have it, Turkey's economy is going to crash. Uh, what we're seeing here is that Russia is saying that the West is breaking the deal. They're not allowing to help them uh, get that food, fuel, and fertilizer out into the marketplace. And now you've got Vladimir Putin basically arguing uh, whether or not this deal is going to be renewed. Remember, it's only for 60 days. And then it has to be renewed. Ukraine is talking about expanding and adding new ports to it. Uh, Mikhailov, uh, potentially, and if they can clear Kyrgyzstan and the waterway to the uh, Gulf of Odessa, adding that. Russia is only agreeing to this because of it, what it benefits them. Understand, yes, they lost the Moscow. They lost Snake Island. They lost those oil platforms they had in the Gulf of Odessa. The Crimea has been hit repeatedly. And Russia was very concerned that the Ukrainians were going to start hitting their vessels in the Sea of Azov and coming out of Novorysk and the Kerch Strait. So they agreed to this. But it is Russia's plan to keep funneling ships out at a huge number? But if they can't get this crop sold, there's no reason for Russia to agree to this. They still have their kilo submarines. They still have aircraft. They still have mines that they could put in the water and shut everything down if they need to. But we're already seeing the impact here by the fact that we're seeing these prices begin to drop. But let's be clear. Only a fraction of what Ukraine exports typically is getting out. We're right around 2 million tons of grain coming out of Ukraine. Normally, it's 5 to 6 million a month. Not to mention the fact how many fields have been disrupted and what's the potential for wheat and grain harvests in the future is down a huge amount. So this deal is teetering at this point, I would say. We're not seeing enough ships coming out. The war risk insurance is, is not big enough to allow a lot of big ships to go in. Uh, we're seeing more ships go into Ukraine. We're seeing it more consistent and steady. But if Russia is not getting what they want, they're going to pull the plug on this. And that has ramifications for food shortages in Asia, in uh, Africa, and around the world and food inflation. All right, let's go over to just story number three. Story number three deals with the supply chain crisis. Just did a video on this on where the ships go that were off Los Angeles off the link above here. So you can go ahead and take a look at that. This is the latest update from Flexport on vessel wait time and rail dwell. And you'll see ports on the West Coast and East Coast of North America in there. You see LA and Long Beach with eight vessels waiting, just a one day delay for ships, but 19 days for rail. Oakland, Oakland is, is just backed up for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is labor issues. 14 ships waiting to get in, 15 days wait on berth. Uh, Seattle, Tacoma has delays because of rail backlog. Go up to Vancouver. Vancouver is just backed up. And this goes all the way back to uh, uh, the Fraser River floods. They have just not gotten caught up since then. 14 to 48 day delay. And then Prince Rupert uh, over to New York, New Jersey, 18 ships waiting off that coast right now. Savannah, 42. Houston, 23. We are seeing those backups. Again, LA and Long Beach, not bad, but we're seeing it shift over to the Eastern Gulf Coast. But the rail issue is one of the big ones here because rail is causing a lot of problems, especially coming off the West Coast into the interior of the United States. Add to it, the latest report coming out here from the National Retail Federation is basically projecting downward on basically retail imports for the last five months of the year. We have probably hit peak season right now in terms of containers and imports. This usually happens in the midst of third quarter. I mean, usually we're, we're, we're right in the middle of it, but right now what we're going to see in basically these last five months, August, September, October, November, December, is we're going to see a downward turn much sooner than you typically do. Again, the video I did on, on Los Angeles talks about this. What we saw happen was everything got front loaded to the first half of the year because of issues with labor on the west coast issues with road rail trucking ab5 uh you name it a variety of issues happened and so we we saw everything front loaded in the front end 
and now moving to the east and Gulf Coast too. And so this report here indicates that we're expecting to see this downward turn in terms of rail. Add to it, we're still dealing with these congestions in German ports, Hamburg, Bremerhaven from the strikes, Felixstowe, Liverpool in Great Britain. And what we're seeing is just this manifestation of North Sea congestion, which is really hindering trade. Understand, congestion in Europe translates to, to slow down and getting goods from Asia to America via the ultra large container vessels that sail from Asia via the Suez Canal, transload at these ports in Europe, and then come across on ships to the United States. All of this means, okay, we're seeing retail slow down. We're going to see the number of containers slowing down. But because of slowdowns in the West Coast, because of slowdowns in Europe, we're going to see those containers kind of trickle in here, not at the rate we expect them coming in. And that has the potential to keep freight rates high uh, because of uncertainty and delays and uh, congestion at points. Because when those ports all of a sudden open up, they let go of floodgate and it doesn't come over very measured. We saw that happen throughout COVID when we saw the opening and closing of ports. I didn't add here, but I probably should have. The shutdown of some ports in China right now because of COVID lockdowns. All of these cause disruptions. It, it, it's, it's not a steady flow of goods. It basically becomes a big sine wave. And when you do that, you create congestion along the, the entire maritime supply chain. All right, let's go ahead and head to story number four. Story number four deals with bulk grain, but not out of the Ukraine. This is out of the United States. So two really interesting stories this week. One, U.S. port delays hit soybean farmers. So this is a story from Bloomberg out talking about U.S. farmers facing supply chain bottlenecks and a surging dollar after losing their competitive edge in the market because of the emergence of a rival, Brazil. And this talks about how during this period of time, that we've seen Brazil become one of the major exporters of grain, principally over to China on these big Cape, uh, Cape size uh, bulkers, these vessels that go around the Cape of Good Hope and are able to go there. Brazil's biggest growing uh, state of Mato Grosso as it does from number two uh, US producer number uh, Iowa. So we're seeing everything shift here in terms of where Iowa was basically to uh, China, what Mato Grosso is now to them in Brazil. Come down here a little bit. Brazil's already starting to reap the fruits of more than 290 billion reyes, $56.1 billion the federal government has invested in roads and maritime gateways since 2008. Brazil has dumped money into their infrastructure. The Amazon, waterways, roads, rail, you name it. And what we're seeing here is the transport costs has come down since the early 2000s, where for every ton, it was costing them over $200 a ton to ship grain. Well, now it's actually equal to, if not just a little bit more than what it costs for grain coming out of Iowa. This is what Brazil has invested in, and it's paying off. They are being, uh, U.S. grain exporters are being eclipsed here by Brazil, and it has a big issue. If we cannot get our grain out, efficiently and as quickly, that's going to be a problem. Now, I weigh it against this story right here, where grain is gushing out of the Great Lakes this year, but largely from Canada, not so much from the United States. The St. Lawrence transported 514,000 tons of grain out of the Great Lakes between March 22nd to the end of, the, to, to the end of July this year, 30% increase. Now, again, Ukraine exports five to six million tons of grain a month uh, at their peak. We're talking about half a million tons coming out across April, May, June, July, four months here. So this is a fraction of what we're seeing, but this is a potential for seeing grain coming out of the Great Lakes. Can we get them on bulkers and get them out through the St. Lawrence Seaway? Of course, you have constraints on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, the locks, the channels, the gates there restrict the size that you can come in. They talk about it here. It's estimated that more than 116 million metric tons of commercial cargo are transported on the waterway each year. 
if the region was a country, it would have the third largest economy in the world with a GDP of 5.5 trillion. Uh, again, if you want to invest in this, and you're seeing Brazil investing in this infrastructure to get grain out, here you go. The Great Lakes is one of those areas you can invest in along with the St. Lawrence Seaway. Again, I watch smack dab dead center in the country. How do you get that grain out down the Mississippi to New Orleans, the grain mills, uh, excuse me, the grain silos down there, or over onto the Great Lakes and directly out that way? Those are the options you have. These are the type of infrastructure issues we should be talking about in the United States. Sending grain to the West Coast is a problem. You can't get out of Vancouver right now because of the delays. Putting grain in containers isn't working because the container companies don't want full containers. They want empty containers. And what this means is U.S. exports, grain in particularly, pile up in the U.S. and we can't get it out. It's just a fundamental problem where we need to be looking at our infrastructure. And when the federal government goes out and gives grants and money to these ports, we should be put, giving that money out in terms of a larger national maritime port strategy, which we don't have. All right, let's go ahead and jump to our last story. Okay, the last story is always one that I find the most interesting that perked up for me during the course of the week. And if you follow this channel in the past, you know, one of my pet peeves is the issue with firefighting and uh, uh, fire prevention on board ships, particularly the U.S. Navy. Uh, as a former merchant mariner, having worked for the U.S. Navy, having gone through Navy damage control and firefighting schools and being a, both a paid and volunteer firefighter in the course of my life, still volunteer firefighter, I've focused on issues like the Bonhomme Richard fire. Uh, recently did a uh, video on that talking about how the Navy's plan to deal with shipboard fire is to put admirals in charge. That'll work. Uh, and then talking about the uh, punishments awarded to the crew of the Bonham Richard for the fire on board, which was almost nothing. And then uh, two videos that looked at the investigation into the fire and why the Navy has got it all wrong in terms of shipboard firefighting in port especially when it comes to fireboats. Uh, I'll have this here. The whole playlist will be up here for you. But it was this story today that struck me. Uh, an editorial from uh, the Thomas Reuter Foundation. U.S. firefighter shortage puts Navy lives at risk. Uh, this story goes into detail talking about the fact that the Department of Defense is having a hard time hiring and maintaining firefighters. And this is putting... Uh, people on bases at risk. They use the example of a heart attack that took place uh, at a base near the Pentagon, Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. Uh, and they talk about the fact that on some Navy bases, fire crews are responding, you know, not with three or four firefighters in a truck, but with only one. And you cannot fight a fire with only one. And this detail here is really important goes in here they talk about the fact that about a third of the 49 positions on the fire department were unfulfilled as of last august and this is talking about that uh, uh joint base there and this seems to be across the way you know one firefighter at one of the u.s navy's largest bases in florida it's got to be mayport said staff shortages meant vehicles that could be manned by three people and running with drivers only ultimately they're going to kill someone Understand, this is one of the reasons why you have issues when Fed Fire appears for the Bonhomme Richard fire, and they're unfamiliar with the ship. There's lack of drills and training with the shipboard crew. This is really important to have personnel staffed on there, not to mention at least the, the care and uh, services they provide for just base personnel on a routine basis, accidents, heart attacks, medical emergencies. You name it. And, and one of the things that has to be done is that this has to be prioritized in the defense budget. You need more firefighters. When you go short with firefighters, you start taxing the firefighters you have, forcing them to work overtime, uh, uh, work longer shifts. And understand, shifts on a fire department are terrible. 24-hour shifts, rotating shifts, you're away from home a lot. Uh, it's not great. Uh, this needs to be fixed. And the situation you're getting to here is that what if we have a situation akin to what happened with Bonham Richard again, and we're going to lack that shoreside firefighting support that's needed to supplement 
the duty crew on a ship where the whole crew is not on board. And if you're showing up with ill-staffed engines and crews that haven't been properly trained or coordinated with shipboard personnel and base personnel, that is a disaster for, uh, there's a recipe for disaster in my opinion. And I think it's something that the DOD needs to look at. They keep kind of kicking this down the uh, 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 proverbial path, you know, hey, we'll put admirals in charge of shoreside firefighting. That's great. But if there's no one for the admiral to command, doesn't work. And that's what's happening right now with the Department of Defense and their firefighters. They need to get more. These should be jobs that are going out the door. People should be jumping at these jobs. And why they're not, I don't understand. It's something that needs to be looked at. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up. And if you can, if you can, support the page. You can do that one of two ways. You get the super thanks button below and contribute directly to the page or you become a patron of the page. Head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link at the end of the video or in the show notes. You can become a patron uh, monthly or yearly, uh, different levels to support the channel. Uh, I appreciate all the support I get. It allows me to put this channel together, give it the time I need to research these stories, join these different uh, news entities so that I can get these subscriptions and put all this together into a manageable format for you and boil it down to one episode every 30 minutes each week, What the Ship. Next week, 50th episode of What the Ship. Really excited about that. Until then, this is Sal signing off.